Okay, I think we'll get started. There might be a few more people coming in, but um, thank you all for being here. As usual, the colors make it a little hard to see everybody, but um, I'm Ann Reynolds, and I work with Brent and Megan and Courtney uh, at the Center for Cooperatives. And I'm very glad to um, welcome Alexia Flynn to uh, give a presentation on milk strikes of 1933. Um, Alexia was, some of you may know her, she was here uh, all last fall semester and actually got to experience January in Wisconsin, <laughs> which was a um, pleasure for her, but uh, I'm sure, but she had been here actually in September, so as she told me, she's, this is her third September in Wisconsin, and so that's, you know, she's had our great weather also. Um, Alexia is a student um, getting her PhD in American history and we're lucky enough that she chose the topic of cooperatives in Wisconsin so she's doing some just amazing original work uh, with the archives mostly at the State Historical Society looking at records of co-ops and the state of Wisconsin um, uh, and, and the university all sorts of institutions that had a role in co-ops as well as you know the um, correspondence of leaders and just a whole host of topics. So I think um, at least in our conversations, her problem is more than about narrowing it down than about finding material. So uh, we're lucky here to have the resources that we do here in the state. And um, I know she has a lot to say, so I'm going to just uh, leave it at that. And but please join me in welcoming Alexia. Thank you very much and for uh, this introduction. So, as Anne just told you, I, I spent six months uh, in Madison last year and I was very well welcomed at the Center for Cooperatives, which even uh, honored me with an office, which I, I'm sure I won't have anytime soon in France. So it's a real luxury. So, I'm really happy to be here today and to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about my research. Um, so, I have been working on the archives for a while, but it's still, I know it's customary to say that, but it's still a work in progress, and I'm not, I have not reached any definite conclusion, so I will be happy to hear your comments. Um, I, ha I am studying the history of the different models of cooperative enterprise that were developed and promoted um, between the 1870s and the 1930s. In Wisconsin, there are links with larger political organizations and movements, and the kind of vision of the economy that they provided. Especially, I'm wondering in what different ways the, the idea of an alternative form of business, which differentiated itself both from government intervention and from um, private corporations, was promoted during those decades. I am dealing uh, in my research with the branch movement in the 1870s, with the progress progressive movement uh, in the early 20th century, and with the evolution after World War I, and also with the Great Depression and the New Deal, and how they changed the dynamics of the cooperative movement. I'm looking primarily at farmer crops, but also consumer crops, and also some worker crops. Here, today, I'm going to talk about um, the milk strikes, uh, so a case study that um, is, takes place in the last part of my story, so the crisis and the solutions to the crisis and the role that cooperatives played uh, in that story. The strikes of 1933 were organized by a cooperative, the Wisconsin Cooperative Milk Pool, and so I'm looking at how the cooperative managed the strikes, how it engaged in those strikes, and what were the consequences. So I'm going to start by um, presenting you an account of the strike, and then the question that this crisis um, is prompting concerning the cooperative's role uh, during the Great Depression. So the oh, sorry. <laughs> the Wisconsin Cooperative Mill Pool was incorporated under the cooperative status of Wisconsin in November 1931 at a time when the agricultural crisis was reaching dramatic proportion in Wisconsin. 
the strikes that the co-op organized took place in a context um, in which farmers were reacting very strongly to the drop in prices and to the foreclosures um, that were um, notifying. The Midwest had always been, uh, since the late 19th century, the theater of important agrarian movements, which were very influential in the development of, of the cooperative movement. In Wisconsin, it was especially the branch between the 1870s and 90s, and the American Society of Equity, which was a very important farm organization. Um, and both of them had an important role in passing cooperative status in the state and in organizing and promoting cooperatives. With the Great, Rush, with the Great, the Great Depression emerged two um, new farm organizations in the early 30s that were uh, more radical than uh, the Society of Equity and the Branch. The Farmers Union, which existed long before the 30s but was created, the state farmers union in Wisconsin was created in 1930, and the Farmers Holiday Association, which promoted um, the withholding of products uh, to show how important it was uh, agriculture. And those two associations were involved in the milk strikes, and uh, we're going to talk about it. Um, the Farmers Holiday Association especially had a broader um, political agenda. It was agitating around the foreclosure questions, also asking for um, inflation policies to have more uh, money circulating, and um, around the question of the prices. The foreclosures were uh, around farm foreclosures yeah. or, or farm business uh, property foreclosures? No, farm, farm foreclosures. Um, in other states, some radical reactions to the crisis also occurred, and there were several farm strikes, not only in Wisconsin, but also in Iowa and Illinois and New York State, for example, between 1929 and 1933. So what happened in Wisconsin in 1933? So as I told you, the Wisconsin Cooperative Milk Pool was incorporated in November 1931. Um, its, ch its charter said that it was advocating uh, the it was promoting a plan of cost of production plus a reasonable profit. So it wanted the, the, the prices of the milk to be fixed to the um, cost of production for the farmers plus profit. Uh, the first idea for them was to, be, to get a number of, farmer, of the farmers organized. Uh, the first objective was 70% of the dairy cows of the state or a sufficient number of members. But soon in 19, so, and, and they got some members, and in 1932, the milk pool claimed to have 5,000 members. One year later, it would be 11,000, mostly in the Fox River Valley, as we're, as we're going to see. So that's um, how the, that was a, a big farm organization, but it was not a very big proportion of the farmers of Wisconsin, which were 180,000 percent at the time. So it was um, always, even if, even when it got at its uh, climax, it never got more than 10% of the farms. Uh, but soon in 1932, the mill pool uh, could not um, achieve its uh, objective of getting enough farmers, so they started talking about uh, getting on strike. In, in June, uh, uh, 1932, Walter Singler was elected president of the pool. He's going to be a very important uh, character in, uh, in the story. I'm going to show you a picture of him a little later. He was a very colorful character that the press liked very much, and they talked about him and showed um, show picture of him because he was very colorful. He was very, very tall and had a cowboy hat and a goatee, and he was talking very... Uh, loud and cried sometimes during meeting uh, while talking about the farmer situations and everything. Uh, he came from Audagami County, which was the center of the protest. And when he arrived at the, when he became president of the pool, the situation was becoming pretty tense. In August 1932, there was a farmer strike um, very intense in Iowa. In November 1932, 
Roosevelt was elected president and a democratic governor for the first time in a long time was also elected in Wisconsin, Albert Schneiderman. And those elections um, brought new expectations concerning farmer, farm relief in Wisconsin and in the US and so accentuating the tension. Um, there were three strikes in February, May and November which um, followed uh, almost the same part, pattern each time. Each time the mill pool was organizing a strike with, in um, collaboration with the Farmers Only Association, which would each time withdrew just two days or before or after the strike, leaving the mill pool alone. Um, the reaction of the state became increasingly hostile. First, a Governor Schneiderman was rather sympathetic to the farmers and uh, say that he agreed to peacefully withholding of products, but as the, as the farmer became, farmers became more violent, he, the reaction of the state became also more violent, and he called the National Guard and there were very, very violent confrontations between the strikers and the police. The strikers were trying to locate the roads uh, and the access to the city markets. They were dumping the milk uh, of the trucks that were trying to access anyway. They were even pouring kerosene or oil into like condensates and uh, creameries. And during the second strike, a farmer fell from a truck and died. During the last strike in November, um, a farmer who was bringing food to the picketers, and he wasn't himself strikers, was shot by a driver who wanted to access uh, the road near Madison. Also in November, eight factories were bombed. And so the press was very, uh, we're going to see some articles, uh, dramatized the events very much and um, pushed uh, the, yeah, the drama uh, around the, the violence and everything. The strikers didn't get much in the end, uh, except uh, national attention. Because in, in May, so during the, the this whole year of strike, in May 1933, the Agricultural Adjustment Act was passed in Congress, which uh, didn't uh, include the cost of production price, but other measures of regulations, principally the control of production. And the state also implemented, uh, implemented some regulations, but Governor Schmidman was, uh, there were some state regulations around the prices of milk, but Governor Schmidman was favoring a national situation, and the only thing he wanted, he was willing to do, was create a milk committee, uh, which is a very interesting source uh, for me, but it was not very interesting for the farmers because it didn't do much. <laughs> and studied the situation and get some information on the milk situation. So the, the, the main, uh, so that's Mr. Singer. <laughs> Uh, and they, they, yeah, there are many pictures of him with a very immaculately cool face. <laughs> yeah. um, and so that's yeah, that's an important one too. I don't know if I can see her a while, but that's a map from the Atlas of Wisconsin, historical Atlas of Wisconsin, um, which is very useful to me. So in the darker green, you have the stronghold of the strikes. So as you can see on the on the Fox River Valley. And which extended a little bit each time, each extended a little um, further east and north. So the different actors that I'm looking at are the cooperative itself and its charismatic leader. Uh, secondly, the the College of Agriculture, which was uh, so that's interesting and we're going to be here, <laughs> which was uh, working. Um, and especially the people from the Department of Agricultural Economics, uh, which was created in 1909 and was teaching cooperation uh, since, had been teaching cooperation since 1913. Benjamin Hebert was the first uh, professor of cooperation here. And the, the, the department had been increasingly involved uh, in the support and even organization of some cooperatives in the state. It was also the object of many criticisms from the farmers and farmers of um, then, another important actor is the Division of Markets of the State Department of Agriculture, that I'm going to call the Division of Markets after now. It was created in 1919, 
um, and for the purpose of assisting cooperative associations in the state. In 1929, there was a law which greatly enlarged the prerogatives of the division and especially stated that it should work toward the organization of, I quote, agricultural cooperative associations along large-scale centralized marketing lines. So it had a big mission of organization of the cooperative sector in the state. Uh, then another important actor was the Wisconsin Council of Agriculture, which was a um, large association of 22 farm organizations and cooperatives, which was supposed to represent Wisconsin agriculture, but was mostly representing um, very um, established and influential co-ops and organizations. It was led by Miles Swanton, that I'm going to talk about a little bit more. Uh, which was a, pro a prosperous farmer, a member of the Madison Milk Producers Association, and which really, really opposed the milk pool uh, strikes and tr attempted to represent the good cooperatives um, versus the radical cooperatives. I'm also going to look at the other cooperatives in the state and at the consumer cooperatives and organized labor which provided support for the strikes. Um, I have, so I have uh, records and sources from these various organizations and institutions that I just mentioned. And I'm also, what I'm doing now is looking at individual cooperatives record to see how the strike was perceived and interpreted in the cooperatives. And also interviews that were um, realized in the 1970s by the um, State Historical Society archives who interviewed people, farmers, uh, on their memories of the farm situation in the 20s and 30s, and so a lot of them talked a lot about the meal strike, so you can see that it was really an important landmark in their uh, farm life, in the farm life in the 30s. <coughs> and they give um, some information, very interesting to me. Um, so my objective today is to replace the crisis in the context of the cooperative environment. How did the organization define itself compared to other kinds of organization? Um, at the onset of the Great Depression. The mail strikes were an interesting moment because different actors were forced to express where they stood to explain what their vision of the cooperative function was um, and the relationships between the different institutions and business enterprise. And it's also interesting to me to see how the to see that the strike was organized by a cooperative institution and that raised the question of the different uses that could be made of the cooperative institutional form. And it raised the question, I'm going to talk about that, uh, um, if I have some time, of the relationship between the political and the economic dimensions of cooperative organizations. What I'm trying to do in my um, general dissertation is to question a division between a period where the cooperatives very political and not economic and very unsound types of business in the 19th century and just before the 1920s and a period in the 1920s after which the cooperatives would be only economic and very uh, efficient institutions. And so I'm, yeah, I'd like to show that it's a little bit more intricate than that. Um, so, in yeah, so first. Just sorry, is that, is that sort of an established uh, kind of narrative within the yeah. historical a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you have the unsound cooperative which failed before the nineteen twenties and then they got they got it how they should do it and it was better after that. And they did a little bit yeah, the unsound ones were more politically motivated too. Hmm? And the unsound yes. ones were more politically motivated. Yeah. Um so in the first section I'm gonna talk about the the cooperative environment uh, during the mill pool uh, crisis and um, how the cooperatives appeared as a solution to the, to the agricultural crisis of the 30s. Then how the strikes uh, um, showed the opposition between the different cooperatives conception. And finally, in a short conclusion, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the mill pool evolved after the strikes. Um, so, the economic crisis that started in 1929 uh, reached the farmer very deeply. 
the price uh, dropped and the uh, farm debt became a growing problem. So that's not very clear, but just to show you how much uh, the farmers were depending on milk in 19, so that's uh, 1928, but it was pretty much the same in 1931, 53% of the gross income of the farmers came from milk. And it was the case in every part of the state. So that is, uh, what's in black is the gross income that comes from milk, and you can see the, that it was very important in the Fox River Valley, but also in the eastern part of the state, in the western part of the state, and, uh, and the north. Um, there are many figures to illustrate the drop in prices. The, the one that we find the, the most often are these, what the farmers get for their 100 weight of milk and how it dropped uh, from 1919 to 1932. Uh, that's another illustration. So here is 1930 and the drop in prices after that. Um, there were some disparities, of course, between farmers and between re re regions, um, especially because of the true price system, which provided that farmers selling the, their milk for fluid uh, use were receiving a higher price than those for manufacture um, uh, dairy products. And the drop of prices was uh, a result partly of an increasing production and from a reduced demand from consumers, but also from the practices of the large dairy companies that were dominating the market and partly manipulating the true price system at their advantage. The industry in Wisconsin was dominated by two large companies, dairy companies, the Borden Company and the National Dairy Products Corporation. Um, there were many investigations, especially by the College of Agriculture and the Department of Markets, to understand how the companies could manipulate the prices and what to do to avoid that. And so that's one, uh, for an example of the results that the, those studies uh, came up with. So you can see that the drop in the prices between 29 and 30, uh, 133 affected the farmers the most, and thus uh, the manufacturers and the merchants. Um, in this context, I am interested in how, what was the cooperative status and how was they, were they presented as a solution uh, for the for this kind of problem. Um, so first remark, there were an important number of cooperatives in the U.S. and the state of Wisconsin already existing in 1931, before the World of course, around 1,500 in Wisconsin. And the most precise figure that I have for the proportion of farmers engaged in cooperative activities is for 1919, so it's been for a but it's around 25% of Wisconsin farmers, and it was probably more than that in 1933. Do you have, maybe you're into this, but number, you didn't come across anything on the percentage of milk that was handled, of all the milk that was handled? No, was I'm not cooperatively? Mm -hmm. Yes, I have, and not for the milk, I have that for butter, and it was, I have that somewhere, I think it's 63% of the milk uh, of the state's butter in 1928 was under five cooperatives. And 40, 8% of cream raising Wisconsin were cooperatives. Um, so that's the, the evolution of the number of associations. So you can see that the peak was at the early, in the early 20s and then it's decreased a little bit due to mergers of some co-ops and also um, failure of other co-ops. Um, the, the history, all of, of course, all cooperatives uh, and their cooperatives were not um, organized by farmer movements, but some of them were, and there was a strong association in, uh, in the history of, of the two, especially the Cheese Producer Federation of Sheboygan County, which was a very important and representative um, cooperative in the state, was organized in 1914 by Henry Cromery, which was, who was a state senator and a member of the American Society of the Group. And it, it was the result of a anti-monopolist fight in the Plymouth, against the Plymouth uh, Cheese Board and uh, the whole story of anti-monopolist uh, uh, struggle. Um, another remark, remark, so 
an important number, association with the farmer movements, and increasing the involvement of the state through the College of Agriculture and the Division of Markets. Um, it's, been, it's a long story that goes on uh, since the late 19th century, but um, the action, what's important to me is that the actions of those two institutions contributed to familiarize the farmers with the cooperative form organization, of organization, and the, the staff uh, gave information, practical help, and sometimes even participated actively in the organization of cooperatives. They tried, for example, to implement a uniform system of accounts in the 1920s in cooperatives and were sending people in cooperatives to help them um, manage their accounts. Uh, and they also offered auditing service at the reduced rates. This evolution and the involvement was not always very um, well welcomed by the farmers, but it contributed to change the cooperative environment. Cooperatives were also very much promoted, especially in the 20s at the federal level. So there were, there were several uh, landmark uh, legislations that were very important, which provided exemptions from antitrust laws or uh, tax exemptions to cooperatives. But in the 1920s, with, especially with um, Herbert Hoover, first as Secretary of Commerce and then as President, the cooperatives were thought as the ways the, the, to organize the agricultural uh, sector as the other sectors of the economy were organized. For Hoover, cooperative associations were thought exactly as trade associations. And um, it was just a way to achieve efficiency and to fight, to struggle against waste and to have a better, efficient uh, form of agriculture. However, there were many divisions, even inside the federal structures, about what was the good kind of cooperative. Uh, divisions between um, the vision of a centralized or federated system of cooperatives, especially in the 20s, there was a big movement for centralization of cooperatives led by Sapiro, uh, a <coughs> California farmer, which was still defended a little bit in the early 30s um, at the federal level. Um, there was also contradictions between um, the idea that cooperatives should be only self-help organizations and that the state should be as much out of it as possible and some uh, officials who advocated a very, um, with, for example, advocated li federal licenses for cooperatives or very regulated cooperative sector. And also there were contradictions between um, with different visions between different commodities, some defending uh, uh, the grain sector and other more the dairy sector. Um, anyway, in 1929, the cooperatives were really considered as an instrument of public policy, either as self-help and we don't intervene, or as uh, we're going to regulate the sector through the cooperatives. And but for most people, it was a way to avoid a too direct intervention of on the state in the economy. It was the idea that if we have the cooperatives, we could uh, avoid subsidy or organizing <coughs> stabilization cooperation or a very complicated scheme that would involve too much the government in the agricultural sector. And through this evolution, um, as you can see, uh, with the involvement of the states, the cooperatives were less and less considered as um, um, protest organizations, but be were becoming very institutionalized and very legitimate tools for improving, improving the situation of the farmers. Um, then, um, in the context of crisis, the utility of the cooperatives were really reaffirmed <coughs> very firmly. The, the, the division of markets was advertising in Wisconsin the, the capacity of the cooperatives to weather the crisis. So in the newsletter of the division of market, you had many articles on the success of cooperatives during the crisis and how they handled things very well. Um, one farmer in the newspaper that would become the newspaper of the milk pool wrote in 1930 that a system of cooperative marketing had been held out to the farmers of this country by both major political parties as the only measure of farm relief feasible. So it appeared as the only solution. Um, 
some cooperatives were really successful and appeared as an explicit model for cooperatives, like the New York uh, Dairyman's League appeared as a model of cooperatives that had to be copied. And co-ops themselves did a lot of discourse around their success and how they were doing well for some of them, and uh, how they had a specific way to handle the prices that was different from what we're doing in the private companies. Um, so, what's interesting to me is that cooperatives appeared as an alternative to many different solutions. They appeared in this, as an alternative to laissez-faire corporate capitalism, that appeared as an alternative to price fixing and state intervention, and they also appeared at that time to an alternative for violent action. The for example, the Farmers Union in August 1932, in its newspaper, was calling for development of the cooperative system to curb the profit system and to avoid a revolution. It was really clearly stating that you have, either you develop the cooperative organization or you're gonna have a revolution from the farmers. So, cooperatives were just an alternative to anything else. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, obviously, they, br they brought some disappointments, <laughs> as you can imagine. And, um, and we can see in the correspondence and the papers of the Division of Market Officials that far very angry farmers were writing about the failures of the cooperative system. Um, what's interesting is that there were very contradictory and different criticisms that were brought to the Division of Markets. The first one was that there was not enough centralization. So it was a little bit a reminder of the Sapiro movement in the 20s, and farmers were um, blaming the over-organization of local groups. The paper, the Nilpol paper that I was talking about, criticized too many loosely organized uh, cooperatives, antiquated local cooperative associations. It demanded uh, so much more uh, centralized and with ironclad contracts and a very organized system. Some farmers were, were saying that the Wisconsin was the most over-organized cooperative <laughs> agriculture in the United States. <laughs> and in 1930s, um, and it was, yeah, they were coming up with very uh, different figures, some of them saying that there were 3,000 cooperatives in Wisconsin. Right? <laughs> comes from the, yeah, there was an inflation of, um, of the numbers that were given. The division of uh, markets itself was recognizing some problems and saying that there were there was too many competition between the cooperatives and it should be more organized. And it, in its um, reports, it was pointing out that problem. Singler, the president of the Mill Pool, insisted uh, in in 1932, so when he became president, on the difficulties that he had with the existing organization, and he said that it was because they know that a basic organization would eliminate a lot of so-called cooperatives that are formed merely to give jobs to office seekers and promoters. So he was very <laughs> critical of the cooperatives existed, that existed and, and, and saw the opposition to his, his pool to just, um, as just a way to defend the organized order. There was also sorry, um, uh, a lot of criticisms to the College of Agriculture work saying that they were the, the people in the Department of Agriculture Economics were focusing too much on production and how to bring more efficient production and not enough in marketing, which resulted in more overproduction and in a bigger drop in the prices. Um, and some very angry cooperatives even passed resolution asking for the department to be abolished. So I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 The Department of Agriculture Economics and the Department of Markets. <laughs> Both of them. Um, another kind of criticism was the the idea that which joined a little bit uh, that of Singler was the idea that um, both the intervention of the Department of Market and the institutionalization of important cooperatives were working. More, yeah. Th those new, those established cooperatives were working more and more like corporations, and were not really true cooperatives, grassroots organizations. The, the farmers' union was really conveying that criticism, and um, so there is an interesting interview of Wilbur Wheat, who, who was uh, head of the division of markets in the 30s, and remembered how he went to farmers' union meetings in the west part of the state and was welcomed with. Um, not very nicely with 
farmers uh, yelling at him that the, far the division of markets shouldn't be organizing cooperatives, that it was the job of the farmers' union to do that, and they wouldn't allow the division of markets to organize uh, clubs in their territory. So those criticisms revealed the ambiguities towards taking intervention because the division of markets was blamed both for not intervening enough and for <laughs> intervening too much. Um, the pool was, the good thing for the pool was that it was able to make a synthesis of these different criticisms and to channel the anger around the cooperative uh, existing system. And it was trying to embody a different kind of cooperatives that would uh, change everything. But what's interesting also is that all this work done by the Division of Markets and the College of Agriculture contributed to make um, the cooperative institution as a model that was known, that was available at the moment, and um, that could be used by different farm organizations. The, the legal status was very favorable uh, at the time. And the, so it, it enabled the mill pool to have, uh, to play on all the, the um, the different dimensions because they could recuperate the, um, the institution and say that it was ill-organized and still benefit from the, the advantages of the construction of the long movement. Um, as soon as the mill pool was created, there was a conflict of power between the different institutions that I mentioned, which all wanted to be in charge of on the creation of cooperatives. And so who blamed the mill pool for um, yeah, who opposed the milk pool uh, initiative. Um, yes. Um, the, the first was, was the confrontation with the division of markets, which uh, from the outset uh, opposed the milk pool organization. The meal, in the, one of the objectives of the milk pool in its charter was that it was supposed to get a thorough understanding of all existing cooperatives sincerely trying to benefit the producers by getting a greater efficiency in price and try to unite them. And it, it was seen as an overlap with the missions of the Department of the Division of Markets, which was already supposed to get um, information and to unite the different cooperatives. In the course in January 1932, Charles Hill, the chairman of the division, released an article in a farm newspaper entitled Why State Market Departments Backed Some Co-ops and Not Others. And he was explaining very candidly that he wasn't supporting the pool and because he didn't approve of his philosophy, it was too much centralized and too, he had too high objectives and he, he wasn't supporting of the cost of production plan. Uh, instead, he insisted on the existing organizations that were doing a good job, and the Department of Markets uh, wasn't supporting the pool, which could have consequences given the help that the division could get. Um, however, a few months later, facing the success of the pool, which was organizing very well, the Charles Hill changed his mind and went to a picnic in Appleton in front of the 5,000 uh, milk pool members and said that, of course, he was supporting the milk pool and he was on the right track. And um, uh, they will give every day that it could uh, get to the, to the pool. Uh, however, the opposition resumed as soon as the pool started to talk about striking. Um, and soon the department was accused to try to actively destroy the pool. There were some articles um, about in the farm papers about secret meetings held at the, di the division of markets uh, trying to uh, stop the progress of the pool, etc. The pool was also accusing by the uh, well, accusing the division to try to divide the movement between different territories by helping more the farmers around Milwaukee and less the farmers of the Fox River area, and then. Um, regulating only parts of the state's uh, milk prices, which was uh, working against the efforts of the, the milk pool to create a, for a statewide organization. On the side of the established cooperative was also the Wisconsin Council of Agriculture, which made every effort in 1932 to oppose the formation of the pool, issuing resolution um, against the pool, saying that there were no need of a new organization in the dairy field, and they were supporting also only organization operating with the endorsement of the 
Council of Agriculture, the Division of Markets, and the College of Agriculture. So the very uh, legitimate organization had to back the organization, and you couldn't organize just one new co-op if you wanted to. In May 1932, the Council even passed a resolution supporting a legislation that would prevent, that would forbid the organization of new cooperatives without the permission of the Division of Markets. Um, Swanton, so the, the president of the, the secretary of the Council of Agriculture, in, in, he gave a long interview in the 70s where he comes back on the reason uh, why he opposed the pool. And so he opposed the centralized vision, and he also opposed, as very much I'm going to talk about just now, about the militant uh, side of the pool, which was not, which shouldn't be mixed with the economic uh, objectives. And he described the confrontation between established cooperatives and the pool, saying, for example, Madison and, Mil and Milwaukee Milk Producers Cooperatives felt the milk pool wanted to build upon their experience of established cooperatives. The milk pool wanted the older co-op to join. We were selling at $1.50 per hundred, whereas in other parts of the state, some were selling at less than $1. There was some jealousy, and they tried to get some of our, some of our good prices. We made it clear that we had worked and struggled for that. So they, they, don't want, they refused to join the pool. So we have uh, several and opposition and competing legitimacies that appeared at that uh, time between the established co-ops and the new organizations. The Mood Pool was very much playing on the idea that they were a grassroots organization and that the division of markets was trying to prevent them from organizing. There was also this, the idea of the centralized pool from the entire state versus the, the idea of federation and local um, cooperatives, and also the cost of, of production plan versus the idea that cooperatives just had to be efficient organization, and if they were efficient and applying good and sound marketing principles, they would uh, get out of the crisis by themselves. And then came the strike, the strikes, and. Um, which changed a little bit uh, the environment also. Uh, so my first, the first thing I want to highlight here is how the cooperatives on, how is it interesting that the cooperatives of the cooperators of the mill pool became strikers and what was the relationship between their objectives as cooperatives and, and then their objectives as strikers. Um, so that's just a reminder of the timeline of the strikes. Um, and it's raising here the question of the relationship between cooperatives organization and political action and objectives, which is a long one and has been there. It's everywhere in where I look in my dissertation since the branch, obviously. Um, and yeah, the question was, uh, was the cooperative organization a step towards a more direct political type of action? Or was it because um, it was not, it didn't succeed as a cooperative, and so it <laughs> fell into life? Um, so first, I'm going to look at a little bit at the status of the meal pool members. So, who were there, and where were the relations to cooperative activities? Um, it's difficult to answer because we don't have a very precise list that we could uh, investigate of the members of the meal pool. Um, so that's again the map. Uh, so the first river valley was uh, uh, an area where a lot of Germans were uh, present, but we don't know if that played a very great role, and apparently not. Every minute of the Mopo were in English. Singler was the grandson of a German immigrant, but never mentioned that in his speeches and everything. So the basis for organization seemed to be more uh, economic than ethnic. Uh, some of the accounts of the pool, uh, a lot of the accounts of the, of the milk strikes seem to imply that the, the milk pool members were the poorest farmers in the state. And I found little evidence of that because um, one, what, what we can say that in this area they were mostly producing uh, manufacturer products and not food milk, so they received uh, lower prices according to the true price system. But we have some information of the number of cows owned by the members of the pool, and it doesn't seem lower than the counties, than the other farmers in their counties. 
uh, in general, they were not the poorest areas of the state because the, the counties in the north, uh, in terms of income per farm or income per cow and everything, um, was much lower than it was in the post area. area. Um, there was a study of the 1932 Iowa strike that uh, comes to the same conclusion and tends even to show that the most violent episode of the strikes <coughs> took place in the most, most pro prosperous counties of the state, maybe because that's where the expectations were the highest and where the farmers were used to a higher standard and then where the, the, the crisis stroke, they were um, disappointed and uh, uh, the discrepancy between their expectations and what they get was higher. Um, one question that I also ask is, ask myself is, um, were those uh, farmers less organized than other farmers? And were, did they have uh, fewer co-ops? And that's why they went on strike and everything. But, um, and we have some evidence of that, but not very, tr not true in every county. Um, in Audagami country, so the, which was really the nerve center of the strike, uh, there were around, um, 80 cheese factories in 1931, and only six of them were cooperatives. Compared to another county, I think, which is Green County, in which um, where 95 percent of the cheese factories were cooperatives. So you can say that in the counties that were most cooperatives, there were less effect of the strike. But it's not true of Dutch County, so. It's hard to have definite conclusion on the number of clubs versus uh, uh, strike territory. But it's interesting to ask the question between cooperatives already existing and the strike movement, because for example, in the New York, New York State strikes in 1933, it was explicitly a movement directed against the New York dairyman leagues, so versus the established co-ops, which were managing to get good prices from the dealers, whereas the independent farmers weren't members of the co-op and couldn't get in, were left out of the, um, of the prices. More, um, more precisely, I wondered also about the thing, links between political actions and activities of the milk pool and their cooperative uh, organization. There are several uh, historians and sociologists who worked on that question on the links between political activities and cooperatives. For sociologist Mark Schneider, for example, he's, like, he's studying the Grange uh, in the Midwest in the late 19th century and shows with quantitative data that the Grange turned towards cooperatives when they were failing to get um, reform, legislative reform. So they turned to economic actions when they couldn't get um, political reform. Lawrence Goodwin, on the other hand, uh, worked in the 70s on the populist movement. And he, for him, he had a very strong hypothesis on the on cooperatives, which was that co-ops were a step towards political radicalization. They were the moment where the farmers got trained and understood, could get together and understand how the system was working. And that's when they understood that the system was working against them, and then they decided to go into third party politics. And so, it doesn't apply to Wisconsin in, uh, in the 1890s because the populist movement was never as strong as it was elsewhere. But um, it could be an interesting frame of interpretation for studying the mill strikes, maybe because the collective bargaining objective was not possible to achieve, the farmers turned to more radical political action. So it wasn't political in terms of they didn't create a party, even if they had some political affiliations, but they turned to striking because they couldn't uh, succeed in the cooperative uh, work. Um, just one thing. Uh, one thing I looked at also is the relationship between farmers' organizations, so the which had a political agenda and cooperative, and the pool. It had a good relationship with the farmers' union. The farmers' union actually left the Council of Agriculture in 1933 to protest uh, against the Council of Agriculture attitude during the strikes. So it was supporting the mill pool and left the Council of Agriculture in protest. 
then the Farmers' Holiday Association was very often associated in accounts of the strike uh, with the milk pool. The, the only thing was that the Farmer Holiday Association was leading penny auctions during the foreclosures era. That is, they were after the, the farms were foreclosed, there were auctions to sell the farms, and the Farmers' Holiday Association would come and buy the farms for nothing, and then give it back to its previous owners. And um, there was a long, and for some farmers, uh, interviews for the, of the farming union members who considered that penny auctions in Wisconsin were outgrowth of the strikes, that they were really coming in the same movement. And for example, in 1932-33, there was the moving story of um, Max Kishon, who was evicted from his farm in Elkhorn with a machine gun. And uh, so there was a lot of emotion around his case. And the member of the mill, he was a member of the mill pool, and um, the, the mill pool decided to pay for his defense and to really engage uh, in his case. However, when, however, a member of the mill pool got in, I think, March 1993, arrested for uh, inciting um, a riot after a penny auction. And at that time, Singler said that they could forget, they should forget the foreclosures and concentrate on economic actions because they didn't want the bad publicity that the former holiday people were bringing. And so they were trying to make a, dis a difference between the political action of the former holiday and the economic action of the poor. Um, the violence of the farm strikes uh, were increasing during the year 1933, and the press insisted a lot on the violence, with title like, on the, milk st on the state milk strike front, more violence, with a picture of uh, Singler in the middle, or um, describing the new sheriff of Shawana County, who directed the defense against strikes, pickets with military tactics, and they were using a lot of military words and talking about milk battles and milk wars and everything. And, and the truth is that there were more and more violence and more and more people hurt and arrested and even uh, dead. So that's one of the strikers arrested and hit in the head. We have also, so that's uh, the famous dumping of the milk uh, of the truck in the trucks that were trying to break the pickets. Um, and so you have the picture of the deputies uh, that are powerless to act in front of the violent strikers. We had also more violent pictures, like that one, of the <laughs> bone squad uh, uh, of the National Guardians, uh, ready to fight against the, the strikers. And finally, the bombing of the, uh, which were the climax in November, of the bombing of the cheese factory. Um, this violence and this proximity between the mill pool and the violent incidents was used by the mill pool opponents to show that it wasn't a true cooperative. And they were insisting on that a lot, that the fact that he was using militant tactics and, and violent actions was um, really the proof that it wasn't cooperative. The accusations of socialism and communism support to the strikes were everywhere in the press and the opponents were, um, even if we don't have a lot of uh, evidence in the, in the records of the Ming Poli was everywhere in the press that the socialists and communists were obviously supporting the strikes and trying to create disorder and take power in the state. Um, it was presenting as an unsound and an emotional cooperative in the world. Whereas the sound cooperatives were trying to do their work. You know, what's interesting also is that there were a lot of there was a lot of insistence on the personality of Singler and his, the fact that he was a dictator and he was uh, inducing farmers, almost hypnotizing them to do things that they didn't want to do. <laughs> and um, articles in the press uh, calling, saying that Singler was the man behind the milk strikes. And that was a way to show that the milk pool wasn't cooperative because it wasn't democratic, because it was just led by one man and there wasn't the democratic participation and it wasn't uh, led, organized by the farmers, but it was just Singler who got crazy. And and use very bad habits. So I'm going to my last one. Um, and so that's oh, 
who supported and who opposed the strikes is, is interesting to see where the co -op, that particular cooperative association stood. Um, first, we can re um, notice that there was a lot of anti-corporate rhetoric uh, from the part of the mill pool and its reports about the profits of the mill trust, the milk barons, um, and the support of the mill pool uh, in 1931-32 defined the cooperative marketing solution as, I quote, the replacement of private business with public business or at least semi-public business. So there was the idea that cooperative was not private businesses and there was another kind of business. Um, as I already said, uh, I think, a few times, there was an um, ambiguous position of uh, the um, the pull towards the state's uh, intervention. Mm, yeah, I'm, it's too long, so I, maybe I'm going to skip that part, but the idea that it, they were both defending and uh, fearing the state intervention in fixing milk price, for example. Um, in, the midst, in the midst of the strike movements in May 1933, was introduced a bill to, by a representative of Buffalo County, Buffalo County, which proposed to regulate the milk as a public utility, uh, <laughs> as gas and um, uh, light and water, and so it should be So it didn't work, but it was, there was an experiment of that sort in New York State between 1933 and 1937, and some people were talking about that. But um, the cooperators in, in the middle and elsewhere were well, very much against that because it was too, too, much, too much state intervention. Um, and cooperatives are, were defended in front of this public utility uh, proposal as a better method. Um, the, um, one thing interesting to me was also that the milk pool got the support of the consumers' movement and the cooperatives' movement, uh, the co consumers' cooperatives in the state. First, in Madison, uh, there was a group of progressives, especially from the University of Wisconsin, <laughs> and um, Anna May Davis was a research. She was an economist, and she was a research assistant for Professor Commons. So she was really interested in collective actions and collective uh, institutions. And she was organizing cooperatives, and she was um, she formed she participated in the formation of the Consumers League in 1933 during the strikes. And the league supported uh, the support to the farmers, even started the seven day strikes um, of milk in support of the farmers. And the strikers uh, welcomed that help, and they were trying and they were trying to build community support around their actions. They kept, during the strike, they kept uh, delivering milk to hospitals and they were, um, they also organized uh, milk distribution for the poor and they were um, willing to have people come directly to the farm and buy milk. What they did was just block, what they wanted to do was block the usual uh, circuits of distribution, but they were ready to organize something else. And so that worked well with the consumer cooperatives who want to work cooperators who wanted to organize direct uh, relationship with the producers. And in 1933, 1934, the Consumers League evolved into the Madison Consumers Cooperative, which was a dairy co-op, uh, uh, combining members of the mill pool, progressives in Madison, and even a member of the American Federation of Labor in Madison. Um, other important part of the consumer movement was uh, up north in Superior with the uh, Central Cooperative Wholesale, which was a big wholesale cooperative with um, over, I think, around 200 retail stores, which was very organized and politicized. And I didn't find a lot of things in their records about the milk strikes, but their, their newspaper, the Cooperative Builder, mentioned uh, the strikes and tried to adopt a very large view of the solution that could be brought to the farmer's problem, and he was involved in both consumers and producers cooperatives working together. And, uh, uh, so they took the opportunity of the mail strike to give a larger definition of the cooperative system and how it should work. And finally, there was the support from the labor movement. So as I said, they participated in cooperatives with the mail pool. There was also an official support uh, from the AFL Wisconsin to the mail pool, which, um, and they engaged, they agreed to not buy uh, non-milk milk and singular agreed to 
encourage the milk pool members to buy union goods. So there was uh, some kind of agreements between them. Um, the political evolution of the milk pool also reveals its association with the labor movement, since the milk pool participated after the strikes in 1925 in the formation of the Fa Fa Farmer Labor Progressive Federation, which affiliated with the Progressive Party. Um, and final, finally, the milk pool and other cooperatives. So that's a big part of what I want to do, but I'm really not finished with that research. Um, so, but I'm interested in how the, the cooperatives reacted to the milk pool and if they identified with the pool as a cooperative or if uh, they rejected its action. And it's, not, it's pretty unclear now for me. But what I know is that the milk pool did not, did not reserve a special treatment for cooperatives. Um, during the strike, so if uh, cooperative trucks were trying to accept the road, they would blockade them as any other ones. Um, in this, what shows in the records is that the cooperative appeared as a platform where farmers could discuss the opportunity of the strikes, and the records show an increasing importance and involvement of cooperative members in the strikes. For example, I have a, I have a co op in Ladysmith, uh, incorporated in 1924, and for the first strike in February, they passed a resolution saying that they would not talk at all about the strike inside the cooperative. And then in the second strike, they were talking a little bit more and they received a milk pool field man and uh, farmers union members and then talked about it. And during the last strike, they had a strike committee at the cooperative <laughs> uh, voting on the cooperative. So it apparently took more and more importance. Um, some co-ops, obviously, uh, aligned with the position of the Wisconsin Council of Agriculture and opposed very much the strike, saying that it wasn't cooperative enough. For example, the Consolidated Badger Cooperative, organized in Shawana County in 1931, talked about the milk pool and the strikes as a stumbling block on the road of the cooperative development. Um, and then I'm going to finish. Um, so. The, at the end of the crisis, the mill pool didn't succeed. Uh, there were federal, federal and state uh, orders to regulate mill prices uh, in the mid-30s, um, 1935 and then 1937. The mill pool didn't achieve the cost to implement the cost of production plan. It did not resolve the fine crisis, and the, the strikes were even costly for the most of farmers. In most studies, the crisis is presented as having the merits to uh, draw the attention towards uh, the, the urgency of the problems of the farmers and that accelerated the process of regulation. I would also argue that it served as a moment of redefinition of positions uh, in front of cooperation, redefinition of expectations. The failure of the pool may have implied the end of the big centralized scheme on a statewide uh, level. It also led to more awareness about the limitation of cooperative possibilities, but on the other hand, it contributed to revive a protest tradition within the cooperative movement and to create new alliances between uh, cooperatives that were willing to uh, work with them. Uh, the mill pool evolved uh, a little bit in a different direction in the 30s. It turned to more classical marketing cooperation. Uh, it opened several plants, uh, which were mostly successful in the mid-30s. According to Swanton, so the Secretary of the Council of Agriculture, it became an effective and constructive farmer organization. <laughs> and it was even uh, integrated in the Council of Agriculture, which had fought so hard against it. Um, so some radical proponents and supporters were really disappointed by its evolution, and for Ruben, who was the a labor attorney who had defended the milk pool during the strikes, it was just becoming a business proposition. So that was uh, too bad. And um, in 1934, the pool made an agreement with the Commission Merchant in Chicago. So it was financed with private um, sources. And a member of the Farmers Union, in an interview, regretted that situation, saying that the money was coming from a private source, which was not a cooperative in any sense of the word. So by evolving in that direction, the mill pool had lost its cooperative uh, credentials. However, the, the pool kept a progressive uh, dimension. So it in was involved in the Farmer Labor Federation, and it 
also, after being integrated in the Council of Agriculture, it left the Council of Agriculture in 1939 because it was too anti-labor and uh, it was promoting anti-labor uh, legislation, so the pool left the Council on that occasion. And finally, the pool went bankrupt in 1940, uh, which is also a very interesting case, uh, which highlights again the ambiguous position uh, of cooperatives among co um, economic organizations because it was to, supposed to be forced in involuntary bankruptcy by its creditors, and he, it, um, there was a trial where the pool tried, tried to argue that as it was a cooperative and not a corporation organized for profit, it should be exempted from general uh, federal bankruptcy laws and not to be forced into involuntary bankruptcy. And there was a long trial with uh, back and forth decisions, and with a lot of arguments that are really interesting to read about uh, cooperatives as a public uh, service and public institution that should be defended by the state. But finally, they lost. And um, but that controversial decision all, once again illuminated the ambiguous uh, status of cooperation. Thank you. <laughs> So I'm fascinated by the, the time trend of the price, and I'm curious, uh, I got inspired to have a look at this book on the New York Times bestseller list about the history of A&P. Mm -hmm. So A&P supermarkets were actually yeah. more, more, more vigorously opposed than Walmart has been mm -hmm. opposed to. And they, I believe they came to Wisconsin around that time. So I'm just wondering on the supply side, was there a monopsony power that developed, or what explains the fall in price? You know, I'm wondering about... I, I don't have a real answer for that, but I can go back to the, to the chart. Yeah, yeah the, the, the chain stores were really opposed. Uh, and the milk pool actually committed not to deliver milk to the chain stores, even after 1934. Mm -hmm. And the cooperative, the consumer cooperatives were persistently uh, fighting against the AMP. And, but I don't know if they had... Uh, but what's your, you talk with your question of what explains the, the price yeah, drop? The price drop, whether well, it was, you know, it could be larger chain stores that come in general, to have more efficient. general economic yeah, it's depression. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. depression. That's what happens in depression, the price is <laughs> I think that's where the name came from, Tom. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> but, but the Sorry, I'm looking for a more interesting explanation. <laughs> the man collapsed. The, okay. But the percentage of where the profit was yeah. going is significant yeah. as well. Yeah. There yeah. was a jump in what the processors were getting the pie charts. Yeah. Right, but that's a more yeah. that's a more general phenomenon, Marcus, that the the, the the you know the percentage of the price drop borne by the farmer generally is higher than the percentage of the price drop borne by other elements of the supply chain. And that's that's true today, it's true, it's been true as a, a general empirical what what explains it? We don't I mean that's that's, that's an open that's open a question, but it's not unusual. Right. Yeah, but for farmers we don't take that as a Necessarily acceptable. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh well. So speaking to that, it was one of the outcomes in having the state do legislative or regulatory work. Was it effective in essentially changing then how that pie chart was distributed, and did the farmers through regulation end up getting a larger share? And, you know, instead of having. 34 to 30 cents that they were able, even though the price per hundredweight had dropped by a dollar, mm -hmm. were they, did the subsequent regulation help increase that? Price? I don't really know. What I know is that the prices uh, went up again. So maybe that was not as much, they were not as much preoccupied by who was getting uh, the, the share of the money and everything. But, and they were not as many farmer movements and farmer protests in uh, they were they were not happy with the triple a regulation that we were talking about it a lot but as far as outcomes are concerned i think it was better than it was uh, before the 1930s yeah can you go back to the, the map of the, the, uh, the other the other map uh yeah Mm -hmm. So, uh, 
Yeah. So there was no there was no price pooling at this. There was no revenue pooling at this. There was no pooling of any kind of uh, sales and distribution back to producers prior to the regulations that were implemented, implemented during well, the Well, I'm trying to think of Wisconsin at the, at the national level. The co-op started in the 20s, 22, to classified pricing. Okay, the co ops Rather than flat pricing, and then they would try to pull back to producers. I don't know how much that was going on in Wisconsin out of the Northeast. Because so, you know. what I'm wondering is if a lot of the, it sounded like a lot of the uh, less militant or more satisfied producers were in the urban areas yep. where there was more north more demand for fluid milk and where well, they could sell more that fluid is a milk. Factor. Yeah. And then so in these other areas they were selling to butter and cheese manufacturers, yeah. which meant lower prices. Mm -hmm. And so they were trying a lot of ones were disturbed up more one hypothesis would be that they were they were trying to get into the urban yeah. market and they couldn't. And so that was upsetting. Yeah. Is that is that consistent yeah, with yeah. What and, and well, I think you're right on that. What's interesting is that the regulation that took place after 1933-34 was actually using the agreements that the cooperatives had in the urban areas, so in Madison and Milwaukee, yeah. uh, with the dealers to have to regulate prices. They were using those agreements and right. say, okay, let's try to have everybody. That. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the corollary to this point being that during the depression, the demand for manufactured final product. Drop yep. dramatically than for fluid milk. Probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So families would not stop buying fluid milk, they would stop buying butter and ice cream and cheese. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And so that's so why, that and so then the farmers would do more, would try <coughs> to produce more fluid milk, yeah. which mm -hmm. would let lead to overproduction, and then right. the surplus was manufactured, and then <coughs> they dropped the prices again. Right. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> yep. yeah. um, in your research, did you find that how the state and or the university changed their tactics or um, their dedication to co-op development after this? Like, did, did how did they react in terms of their commitment to developing these co-ops and the way that they went about that? Mm, I cannot really see. There is not a clear uh, change. There was a change of staff at the division of markets, so there were new people after, I don't know if it's clearly, they were not fired uh, during the crisis, but there were new people uh, that were working and that maybe were more concerned with marketing as the strikers were asking them to. And um, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know that if there was really, there were, and the main, in the College of Agriculture, the dean that was in place before 1930 was Dean Russell, and he wasn't, convinced that marketing was an interesting topic and he was not, he was, there was some work, of course, Hebert was working uh, in uh, cooperative marketing for a long time, but he wasn't promoting a lot. And so when he, he resigned in 1930 and there was a new dean who came from the USDA and who had more experience and he was more uh, prompt to answer those. Uh, but there was also I, I, it's not in the college, it's in the extension station in the mid 30s. They were really anti consumer co ops and they were they were having workshops uh, where some uh, farmers wanted to invite consumer co ops to talk about uh, interactions and they, they, they wouldn't allow it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was some, but there was different perception in the extension in the Department of Agriculture Economics and the uh, Division of Markets. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and one of your conclusions you. Um, said that the, the strikes were successful in um, reviving the tradition of protest and of farmers. How much was that sustained by, I mean, it wasn't sustained by the milk? Yeah, well, but it's, was it sustained in other ways? I can see that in the way that yeah, yeah. Yeah, how much it was an important event for farmers can be seen in the house. How it's present in the interviews of the farmers of the 70s who talk about that period as maybe a moment when uh, they understood how cooperative could be something else than just burgering uh, milk uh, together. But there was not many um, that many protest movements that were so important. But for example, in 1939, when the milk pool left the Council of Agriculture, it was around. Um, a controversy because the council had promoted a uh, very anti-labor legislation which passed to the Employment Peace Act 
which was made to... At first, the farmers and the cooperatives tried to be exempt from labor laws, which were too, uh, too much constraint, and then they couldn't be exempt, so they promoted a new law. And um, many of the farmers' organizations were, and the cooperatives were really against that, and I think it was the follow-up of the alliances that took place during the milk pool, and the farmers' union was, uh, so the milk pool left and the farmers' union protested against this legislation, saying that it shouldn't be promoted, cooperatives shouldn't be promoted uh, anti-level legislation. So maybe that's an example. Also, in 1935, Wisconsin was the first state uh, where uh, cooperatives, were, there was a law which compelled cooperation to be taught in public schools, in high schools, and, um, middle school, but high schools. And uh, there was an alliance, an alliance between consumer co-ops and farmers co-ops to have that uh, law passed, and it was really. And then there was a lot of agitation around what kind of textbooks they were going to write <laughs> for the teachers to be trained. And, um, I want to follow up on the price drop, and I'm feeling guilty for jumping on town and drop price drops. So let me, uh, let me just throw in one more elaboration here. As the depression started, when prices fell, ordinary firms could stop producing. They could say, look, prices fell, yeah. I'm shutting down. Right. And they would lay workers off, right? And that was that's the entering of the depression phase. If you're a dairy farmer with eight cows or 42 cows, twice a day, you face this deluge of product, and you are not free to shut it down, or you, unless you kill the animals or something. So what, in the face of falling demand, what you have is this continuing rush of product, mm -hmm. which then will cycle down, as you say, and then that accentuates the price of Is that what? Yeah, sure, sure, And there were, that's why also, yeah, there was a whole social organization during the strike, because the milk farmer couldn't milk the cows because they were the pickets, so the women had to yeah, yeah. milk the cows, and then they were distributing the milk because they, Cows have to what to do with yeah. it. You can't shut your doors and you're not going to produce widgets anymore. You got milk coming. Biology trumps economics. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? Biology trumps economics. Exactly. <laughs> Most of it is just the last supply. Yes. Yeah. I think shortly after this, a uh, couple of lessons, not just in Wisconsin, but dairy co ops across the country, realized with their experience of trying to negotiate classified pricing, trying to bargain, put heat right together. They went nationally yeah. with National Milk to form two things, 1935 marketing orders and 37 federal orders, mm -hmm. which forced the clients to pay classified pricing mm -hmm. and really was opposed to the bargaining effort of dairy co-ops starting right after. But they learned lessons here, mm -hmm. realized they had to go a step further with some federal legislation. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, and the, it's unclear for the milk pool members how they realized that the problem was a national one because they were appealing to the governor. And then when Roosevelt was elected and there was national res the legislation, they were they sent uh, somebody to Washington uh, with no, no, no success, but uh, they were trying. And then w when the legislation passed and they realized that it wasn't including the cost of production, including the cost of production plan, they, they turned against that legislation and a lot of the literature of the milk pool was against the, that the federal state which was getting it right and everything. And yeah, the farmer holiday tried to have a national strike uh, in May 1933, but uh, Wisconsin was one. <laughs> research as you heard but I think we made a commitment to get her uh, French <laughs> her dissertation in French translated into English and made it available so in any other papers so we'll look forward to um, the next um, phase of your work. Thank you.